Hey, photographers, welcome to the Boca Podcast. I'm your host, Nathan Holritz, and I'm here to help you build a sustainable photography business. That means improving your photo skills, building on your business knowledge, and honing your marketing abilities. But it also means helping you work more efficiently so you don't get burnt out in the long run. We do try to bring the show to you commercial free, so make sure to check out our sponsors, photographersedit.com and milu, M-I-I-L-U.com. Photographers Edit is custom photo editing for the professional photographer, and milu is the simplest way to create and manage timelines and shot lists for the events you're photographing. Again, photographersedit.com and milu.com. All right, let's get into today's episode. All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we're back for another Boca Podcast episode, and uh, I'm joined by a new, brand new guest, Alex Ingram. Alex, thanks for hanging out with me today. Of course. Thank you for having me. I, and I realize I'm, I'm starting to say that phrase, hanging out, but uh, quite a bit, actually, with, with the various guests that are coming on the show, but I, I do want it to be that thing. In fact, you and I were chatting before we started recording, and uh, I was telling you, I was like, look, you know, I know we have an outline, we have questions to get to, and you know the direction we're going to go, but I don't want it to be robotic in any way. And it's, it's great to be able to just sit, have conversation. And you and I got to do that before we even started recording. I'm really stoked to dig into this conversation today. Oh, likewise. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a different time for sure with, uh, you know, being stuck indoors and having these virtual conversations, but let's make it feel like it's just a one-on-one. Absolutely. Yeah. And we're going to, we're going to do that. We're going to actually get into a really fascinating conversation, uh, to me anyway. And I, and I think this is going to go even better than I even expected, um, your perspective on how teaching made you a better photographer. And and I think it's especially, um, and, and the, by the way, the reason why I say, I think it's going to go even go even better than expected is because, um, you know, I, as much as you've had the, the opportunity to teach photography, you're, you actually have quite a background in teaching, correct? Yeah. Um, it's kind of been a, um, a roundabout way to get to the, to the teaching position. And, um, you know, I'm happy to really go into in depth on that particular topic because I actually started out, um, working corporate for companies like IMG models and, uh, kind of packed up ship from that sort of position to go into teaching, which was more or less a passion of mine uh, as a means to give back to my community. So it's definitely been a process um, to get to that position, but definitely teaching has been a major influence in my own photography, as well as my means to sort of give back um, to my community. Well, it, and you mentioned, and I guess the reason I said all this, and I, I was rambling a little bit, but um, you mentioned before we started recording that you're a professor. I, I knew that you had experience teaching photography, and I was excited to get into this topic. I didn't realize that you had taken it to the next level with a professorship, um, which is yes. pretty exciting. And um, so that, that just gets me all the more excited because we're going to deal not just specifically with the significance of teaching and how that can make photographers better photographers, because this is a very relevant conversation in the industry in light of the fact that so many photographers are trying to teach at conferences and teach workshops, workshops and do online courses and so forth. Um, but there's a significant element to that conversation, which is communication, learning how to communicate well. And um, this is a kind of a pet topic of mine. So I'm stoked to go there here in just a few minutes. But before we do, um, I normally start the conversation out with a question about brand position, because uh, to begin with, you are a photographer. In addition to being a teacher, um, you've got a really fascinating brand name, actually, Art is Being. Where did that come from? Yeah, um, I'm glad you, you asked that and, that and that you like the name. Uh, yeah, Art is Being, it comes from a concept that I had originated early on, which was um, that art, I feel, is intrinsic to my life. Uh, as a photographer, of course, as a videographer, um, it has a direct correlation in my life. And, you know, that that passion has started early on, whether it was being, a, you know, when I was a kid, uh, painting, drawing, sketching, whatever. It's always been something that's intrinsic to myself. And uh, the way I see it is that art is really a metaphor for our lives as a whole. So whether you're a a chef or you're a lawyer or you're a doctor, um, we all have an art form that we're expressing. And I really think that that is intrinsic to ourselves. So the idea that art is being is really takes shape that um, we're all performing in some level of an art form and that that's intrinsic to us. And I Hmm. wanted my brand always to be something that was never just stemmed in one particular direction. So it's not just wedding photography and it's not just real estate photography or it's not just portraits. And, uh, you know, some people may, may think being a jack of all trades is, is a negative quality, but for me, 
I think it's an awesome thing because it's led my work into so many different fields and working with so many different artists across the board. And again, when I say artists, I use that that term loosely to mean just different people of different backgrounds and different careers. Um, so that's really where that uh, where that mindset for art is being um, came from. And, and fortunately, it has led me to so many places and so many uh, meeting so many interesting people that it's it's really been a blessing. Wow. Okay. Well, that's a really cool background story. And and to go along with that, I mean, it'd be one thing to just have a cool name, but your work truly is is beautiful. And for everybody listening in, um, you're going to want to make sure that you check out Alex's work. His website is Art Is Being just like it sounds, .com, and same thing on Instagram. And of course, we'll link to both of those in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. Uh, but talk to me specifically about your brand position, Alex, as a photographer. What is the, the specific value proposition that you offer to a potential client? Sure. Um, I mean, I guess the specific uh, proposition that I offer to a client is really going to be, um, you have someone that is hands-on, um, in a plethora of different fields. And um, I work, you know, very closely with each and every client to really understand their business and their value points. And therein, not only do the photography and the videography for these brands, but also work with them to partner them with influencers and people uh, in the media to help bring in new eyes to their brand. So a lot of times, uh, of course, there's the actual shoot itself um, that I'm doing. But in that same process, I'm pairing them with like-minded influencers um, that I've found over the years to help sort of build their brand recognition. And one thing that I pride myself on is that the brands that I work for um, you know, they all mean something to me. So if it's, you know, whether it's I'm working in the health and fitness field, um, you know, this is something that's that's like near and dear to me. Um, so if I'm working in that field, I want to make sure that I'm taking on brands that I believe their mission statement and that I truly um, want to work with this particular brand. And likewise, with the influencers that I pair them with, um, I'm making sure that there's some sort of symbiotic relationship um, that we all have. and. What's been fortunate for me is that in in uh, doing this, um, one hand has sort of washed the other. So when I find a brand that works with a particular influencer, I may be able to use this person for another brand or another brand that sees this may reach out to me. So it's been um, really just a, a whirlwind of experience for me um, in sort of building these relationships with these different companies. So I guess very simply, if we were to sum it up, your your focus is on bringing exposure to brands. Would that sum it up pretty well? Yeah, that definitely that definitely sums it up. And and I mean, I'm seeing such a wide variety of work here too. Which uh, I mean, you talked, you alluded earlier to the jack of all trades. I mean, the fact that you're able to, as a photographer, capture such a wide variety of photography. Um, again, speaks to the significant talent involved. And so major props to you for that. And again, I, w- I will encourage everybody to go check out Alex's work online on the website and on Instagram as well. But let me keep going because we have a lot to dig into. Talk to me sure. a- about your experience as a business owner. What would you say uh, has been the most impactful principle or idea behind providing a wonderful customer experience for your clients? Right. I mean, I think the the number one Number one important principle that I could say is really, and this sounds so simple, but really I think the number one thing that I could say is really be yourself. And when I say that, I mean stand true to um, what you believe in uh, as a brand. So you don't want to partner with, you know, whether it's influencers, whether it's brands, you don't want to partner with people that have a, you know, an opposite mindset or something that you don't believe in. And I think what happens over time is if you're really yourself and if you're true to those uh, those feelings that you have, you'll start finding that more and more brands in with a similar uh, ultimate mission statement, uh, they'll start corralling to you as well. And you'll start building a network um, of, of people that becomes much stronger than the business itself. So I think as a business owner, it's important to, to be yourself. And I mean, the second thing I'd probably say is just, you know, have strong interpersonal skills. Um, being a photographer, I think is a lot more than just being able to, you know, click a camera, you know, click the, click the shutter. It's, um, it's really just working with people. And I think 
if you're able to, to maintain a positive attitude, if you're able to make people feel comfortable, if you're able to make people feel like they're the, you know, your client is the most important person in the world, um, that's a major driving force for your business. So I would say that those two principles there are kind of my guiding light. That beautifully summed up. Um, talk to me about time. I mean, we were talking before we started recording about the fact that you and your wife are now, ex- well, your wife specifically, uh, to be technically <laughs> yes. correct, but uh, you guys are yes. expecting in, you said yes. December, right? Your, this is your first? Yes. Yes. This is our first. Um, yeah, we're uh, expecting in December. So yeah, talking on that, that relationship of time here, um, I understand that my time may be divided very soon. Yeah. Well, so that, that really is a great kind of setup for the question that I like to ask, which has to do with time management. And and I know it is going to change for the time being yes. now with your relationship currently, and then a business to juggle on top of that teaching. Right. How do you, is there a particular principle of time management that has made a big difference in being able to juggle it at all? Right. I mean, my main and, uh, you know, I, fo- I follow a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, like uh, Gary Vee is definitely a guiding light. Tim, Tim yeah. Ferriss is, is a major influencer. And, you know, what I hear from them and I, you know, I, I really live by very similar mottos is that and when I'm asked about time management, I think my main thing is really to, you, you have to just make the time. And what I mean by that is in this this industry is overly saturated as is okay there are a lot of people that are you know photographers or videographers or or you know maybe we use the term content creators now right. i i understand that that landscape is so vast and so if you want to compete in this particular industry it's really all about making the time and what i mean by that is you know we we may be bogged down with things like our shoots or we may be bogged down with things like our our edits but I think it's to our benefit to look at those things as just positive experiences. You know, I've grown to love all aspects of the business the same. So when I'm doing my edits, maybe that's my time where I um, I get to listen to music or I get to listen to a podcast or when I'm reaching out for businesses, maybe to work with, maybe that's a time where I really get to, to dig in and understand the landscape of the industry. And those things truly excite me. Um, those things are, you know, like I said, art is being, these are things that are intrinsic to me. These are things that I love. And I think essentially if those are things that you're not enjoying, it may not be a business for you. So you have to be able to make the time that you're ready to invest, um, you know, a large chunk of your day into this and you need to find little hacks to enjoy that process along the way. Um, and if you feel that, you know, parts of your time are being lost because you can't, you know, do whatever, you can't watch that show or you can't, you know, play that game or something, that's, that's you know, it's going to be um, a negative consequence that, you know, you, you, you are dividing your time to want to do those things. I mean, everybody needs a portion of the day to relieve their mind, but I think finding little hacks in between to keep you focused and keep you engaged in, in the business while still having fun with it. That's the way that I find a way to make time. So I'm always in some way or the other, my brain is always sort of diving into the business, but maybe in a more indirect time pr- approach than at other times. I wrote down two ideas here to kind of sum up what you were saying. The first is to make yep. time and and really I, I think it's important and, and it seems like it would go without saying, but the reality is we can create time and we will create time for the things that matter to us. I I used to talk about this a a good bit on the podcast, but I've been amazed over the years, whether it's in the photography industry or just in my personal life with friends or otherwise, um, the number of times that I've heard I'm, you know, quote, I'm busy. And the, the reality is that we're as busy as we want to be. Um, in most cases, and we make time for the things that we want to. So when, you know, I would invite a, a friend out, say, Hey, let's, let's go grab dinner or let's go do this thing. And, and I get, I'm too busy, but then I, you know, I see on Facebook that they're out doing something else essentially. Yes. Um, yep. it's, it just reminds me of the reality, which is that really we're not in most cases, we're not actually quote too busy or so busy. It's just, we haven't either chosen to spend time on a different thing 
um, and or we're not managing our time very well. So we can make time for the things that we actually prioritize. And whether we do that consciously or subconsciously, that is that is what's going to happen. So the way that we manage our time, the way that we spend our time ultimately is a reflection on our priorities. The other thing that you mentioned, though, was leveraging time because you're right. The reality is that there, there aren't always going to be easy schedules as business owners, but we can figure out how to best leverage the time to both get the work done and maybe, as you pointed out, enjoy podcasts or something to, the, to, to that effect. Um, yes. There are ways to effectively leverage the time that we do have so that we kind of get the best, best of both worlds. And uh, I think that's a good reminder, too. But, but you, you mentioned something in passing, and I have to give you a little bit of a hard time about this. You, you're talking about yeah, editing. And I, and I have to, yeah. you know, of course, I own an editing company. So I'm, I'm going to give yep. a shout out to Photographer's Edit and encourage you to give us a shot at some point. But besides editing, um, album design, admin work, or anything else, have you ever experimented with outsourcing or delegation in your business? And if so, what's that experience been like? Right. I have, uh, so I've outsourced in the means of hiring freelancers for jobs that have um, grown larger. For example, a lot of times with uh, not not necessarily photo projects as, as much, but definitely for video projects to hire on extra hands during a shoot and for the editing, you know, they're in, um, I have taken on freelancers and actually tying that into the idea of um, teaching a lot of those people uh, that I pull on for those projects were actually former students. So a lot of times what I'm looking for in the classroom are, are students that are go-getters and that are willing to learn. And I, you know, when I'm watching my students grow over time, when they graduate, and I'm talking at the college level, when they graduate, I'm, I'm always telling them that I'm looking for the skills that they've, they've grown into and that I'm always looking for a helping hand. And if I can see that those, uh, those attributes are, you know, being instilled in them and that they seem like they're ready to grow. Those are oftentimes the people that I look, uh, those are oftentimes the people that I look forward to, to bringing on to a project. Hmm. But yeah, in terms of delegating or or outsourcing the business, most of the stuff I would say is done in-house by me. And when I say by me, my wife is uh, inadvertently sometimes tied into this process as well. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I definitely have to give her um, a, a heck of a lot of props for all the things that she does to help make things work. But yeah, yeah for the most part, I, I haven't reached out as much as maybe I should for things like edits. So I'll definitely, we, you know, we can continue this conversation uh, <laughs> afterwards to see uh, what, what we may need to work out. Oh, for. yeah, yeah. Well, and, and to be clear, this was <laughs> no meant, in no way meant to be judgmental or, or, or anything, yeah. even meant to be a sales pitch uh, for that right. matter. But um, it, it, I like to bring up the conversation because I, I don't know, you know, not every photographer has experimented with or is actively using some means of delegation in their workflow. And, and that's fine. Um, I, I think right. it's good to, to get into the topic, though, because the reality is for for most photographers, delegation is going to be the biggest source of time savings um, in our business life. And that's just a yes. simple reality. But I mean, editing as photographers, I, and, and I was just having this conversation actually with another photographer. I'm so, I'm so surprised at the amount of responsibility that photographers took on when we transitioned from film to digital yep. when it came to editing. Because, and I started in, with film and shot film for a number of years before I switched to digital as a wedding photographer. And, um, you know, th- to go from, I can just drop my film off at the lab to I suddenly have to spend hours and hours editing my my pictures. It just it, it was maddening for one, and ultimately it just didn't make sense logistically, and that was a big reason behind why I started the company in the first place. But um, I think it's a good thing to keep in mind for all business owners, for everybody listening in, that if you are not in some form or fashion delegating some aspect of your business, um, you are limiting yourself one in time management and and secondly in the the potential for growth in your business because you're trying to do so much of it yourself uh, and that that's going to make a difficult job out of creating a sustainable business for the long run so just something to keep in mind uh, for everybody oh, listening I, in. I, you know to that point I agree with that hundred percent I mean it, I think really like what it what it uh, for me personally what I think it comes down to is uh, the idea because I, there was a company that I had worked for in the past and it was a, it was a place that essentially hired on a team of photographers to edit photos for, for weddings. So you'd go out and shoot the weddings and then anybody on the team essentially could theoretically um, edit that particular wedding. And I think what it comes down to really is this idea is uh, 
are is it just is it just you or are you willing to say that your photography is um a team and i think for me at this point i'm not willing to let go of parts of the reins because i think most of the clients that i'm booking are booking on the basis that they're getting me for that said job but i think as time grows and as uh my business continues to grow the idea of um you know outsourcing or delegation that's definitely um something that i i would definitely take heed to learning more so i appreciate the um the information on it because that is something that i've i've definitely you know, been considering more and more as time goes on. Sure. Well, again, I want to be really clear. This wasn't meant to put you on the spot in any way, shape or form. <laughs> no, it's all good. I, I, I put the question in the outline of, of questions for our guests because I, I think it's such an important topic. Objectively, so I'm not naturally, I'm a little oh, bit really? biased because of my experience, but um, I just think it's a good point of conversation uh, for business owners. So everybody listening 100%. in, keep those principles in mind. Um, and yeah, Alex, of course, I, I would love to, to figure out how we might be able to work together in the future if that opportunity yeah, presents definitely. itself. Um, I, I'm really curious about your answer to this question, being a professor, uh, what has been one of the most impactful business or self-help books that you've read or listened to? Uh, okay. So I, I have like a list here that is like <laughs> so big, but I'm trying to keep it, you know, keep things uh, condensed. So I'm not a professor just rambling on like I am to some of my students. Yeah. G- give me, uh, give me like top two or three then. Yeah. I'll give you top two or three and I'm, you know, I'm going to keep it in, in the basic wheelhouse here. So, okay. And, and, uh, so oddly enough, the first one that I'm going to mention is not particularly a photography book. It's more a book just on, um, self-help or motivation. And this is a a tried and true classic. So I don't think I'm blowing anybody's mind with this one, but awaken the giant within from Tony Robbins. He was, was, uh, it's, it's a one, it's a very quick read. So if you're somebody that's not like a, a reader, it's it's a very quick read to to get into and now just just for clarification, Alex. The, yes. The he wrote that the first version he wrote and the the paper copy paperback maybe hard copy too was like six or seven hundred pages. Are you talking about the digital download that he offers? Yeah, you could do the digital. I, I recommend both of them. I mean, okay. definitely if you want to go into the uh, like the workshop of it too and really take notes yeah. alongside what you're learning, then get the uh, get the true book. Um, if you want to do the audible version, I believe there's like a version that maybe is close to an hour and 40 minutes or something like this. Uh, it's yeah. definitely, definitely, a, definitely a condensed version. Both of them, I think are, are great. Um, and that, you know, that's true with most of Tony Robbins books. Like there's, there's money, the long version, and then you can get a, you know, the condensed <laughs> version. Yep. Um, I'm glad that I'm glad that he does that. Uh, <laughs> Um, but definitely this book to me is, is a catalyst for really just believing that something is possible. You know, I don't know, um, for anybody listening out there, I don't know who's, who, you know, what everybody was raised with or what sort of tools everybody was, uh, guided with in life. But I know for me, particularly, um, photography or even practicing art for, for that means in, in, in my family and in my friend circle, um, was kind of something that was a like a scoffed at idea. You know, it wasn't a wasn't really a true career field to a lot of folks. And so, um, in reading this book and really sort of realizing your own power intrinsically that you know you can shape and create a world that you know you want to to create. And to hear that from somebody in such a positive manner for me was really an awakening in my mind and something that I would recommend anyone, whether you're a photographer or you're just, you know, just a, you know, regular Joe on the street, I would recommend anyone to read this book. And it's, it's a book that I give to, you know, most of my students and I've given it to a lot of members that, you know, even my family for that matter, um, just to get this idea that, that anything is sort of possible. And I think the way Tony Robbins, um, explains his own trials and tribulations of life and expands on how, you know, he's become who he is, is, is a, is a great eye opening experience. Um, and it was for me, man. It, I have to jump in. I think we're going to be best friends because I, I, you yeah. might be the first guest that I've had in the show that made mention of this book first. Like that was the that yep. was their favorite. That was like the, the first book to mention because honestly, his. So it's funny story that the original book that he wrote that I was mentioning it's something like six seven hundred pages, quite long. I I got through about half of it, and right. just that half of it, and, and for whatever reason, I, I trailed off and didn't finish the rest. But just that half of it was probably and and probably still is the most impactful reading that I've ever done in my life Um, when it came to 
realizing that my psychology was a little messed up, to put it lightly, and yep. I needed to make some change. And I literally got tattoos on my arm. So on my right arm, inside of my right arm, I have the word sentaku, which is choice. And then the right. other arm, belief, speaking to that very idea that, that you were just mentioning as well. And, and Tony, for anybody who hasn't read his book, gets into the significance of belief, how that affects the way that we feel, and then as a result, the way that we act. And um, yes. in a culture in 2020 where everybody kind of blames everybody and everything else, um, I think this is a really poignant book because there is a certain element of responsibility that we all need to take as individuals for the life that we want. Uh, and if we're willing to actually buy into that responsibility, and, and not so ironically related very much to this idea of belief, um, it, it's amazing what we can accomplish. So I, yeah, highly, highly, highly recommend it. And for anybody yes. who's curious and they're like, you know what, 700 page book totally turned me off. He does have a digital, so the audio version, I'm a little confused as to why he didn't do a full audio version. I've literally, right. I've literally tried to message him or his team and, and offer to do an audio version, audio book version of the digital download, which is only about 100 pages. And yeah. it's a really great summation of the big ideas that he shares when it comes to particularly the psychological piece. Um, that yes. is just really good. But we'll link to that free download in the show notes of bookapodcast.com for anybody who's not read it. It is an absolute must read, certainly top three for me. Yes, that, that's awesome. Yeah, Tony Robbins is is definitely a, uh, you know, he's a mecca. He's a force for sure. Um, the other book that I wanted to quickly make mention of yeah. was, uh, and here's a, this is another short read um, and also one that you can pick up on Audible, but it's uh, from Mark Cuban. It's How to Win at the Sport of Business. Oh, okay. Um, I love this book because it likens business to uh Basically, it breaks down the a very basic concept, which likens business, you know, whether it's photography or anything outside of it, entrepreneurship, um, to a sport. And I think what I like about it is that all too often we can understand how somebody can get great at something like a sport. There's this obvious time period where the person has to, you know, like let's say it was in basketball because Mark Cuban's a basketball guy, right? If you liken, you know, uh, a, a basketball player, a child. At the beginning, he's maybe not so good. He has to practice hard. He has to, you know, go in with his coach every day. He has to work with better um, players. And then eventually he can maybe make the league. Um, that concept is very easy to, to understand in things like sports. I think it's very easy to understand in, in things like music or something like a violinist first sucks. Like if I picked up a violin right now, I would butcher it. But maybe after 20 years of experience, I'd be a concert violinist. And I think we don't look at that with photography. Oftentimes, a lot of people will look at my career path and say, oh, this is just something that you're good at. Not really realizing all those hours of work that you had to put in um, in order to get there and all those different little things that you learned along the way. So I love this book because it really likens uh, the concept of um, your growth, just like a sport. And I think that that's a good um, analogy to explain sort of the growth pattern that we have as photographers. Wow. Okay. I haven't read this particular book yet, but we're going to make sure to link to both of these in the show notes. And that yes. might be the next one that I have to add to my list. I have I have so many books right now in my Kindle that I'm, I'm just stoked to get into. Uh, oh, but I may have was. to add that one as well. Okay, I appreciate the recommendation. Yeah, and and let's go ahead and just jump right into our our main topic for today, which sure. it, very specifically is is your perspective on how teaching has actually made you a better photographer. Um, you know, the, the thing about teaching that's kind of interesting is we can be decent at a particular skill, but when we're confronted with the need to teach that skill to someone else, um, it naturally puts us in a place where we have to better understand that skill. And the implementation of that particular skill set in order to effectively teach it. So, um, prior to teaching photography, did you have teaching experience of any kind? Right. So, to be honest, prior to teaching, I did not have any true teaching experience. So, um, you know, I had went to school here in California, Cal State San Marcos, and then I graduated with a master's in uh, photography from the Pratt. Institute in New York City. I do have my MFA and had always wanted teaching to be possibly at some point I knew I would use my MFA um, to teach at a college level. I mean, that was sort of the goal in getting it. Okay. Um, but I didn't, I didn't know when that would come into place. So, you know, originally out of college, what I got was a job at IMG Models. So I worked with Art and Commerce, Art Partner, 
um, and IMG models sort of working under some really big names like Mario Testino. Really? And, uh, yeah. Yeah. This was over at Art Partner. Um, wow. Yeah. This, this was his company. This was his photography company. Whoa. So uh, I was working on the more or less the producer role back end sort of side, because at this time, I didn't even believe me being a photographer was a, was a real idea. You know, I, I sort of surrendered to the idea that these greats are the photographers and that this wouldn't be something that I, I would do. Um, and I finally ended up getting a job at IMG models and I worked as an art director there, um, for about two years, you know, working with some really, really great and influential people. Um, but I really, I, I felt, um, a little bit at a loss because, while I, I liked the career that I had, I felt like I wasn't contributing enough to, I guess, society as a whole. I mean, I was editing the, you know, these pictures and I, I, I felt good about what I was doing. But at the same time, um, I, I knew that there was something more I wanted to do with photography. So um, when I decided to move back to California... Um, I had no idea what direction I was going to go. I started working in advertising. You know, I started working as uh, an art director for an advertising agency, and I, I wasn't digging that so much either. Um, so in my meantime, what I would do is I would look around for what organizations were trying to give back through photography. And, and here in San Diego, we have um, a section of San Diego called Liberty Station, which is an old naval base that was converted essentially to an arts community. Um, so all the old naval barracks now um, are mostly small businesses and a lot of them artists. And one day I was just perusing through this station and I found this um, organization called Outside the Lens, which their goal was to um, provide cameras and resources to communities that were marginalized. And I thought this was the coolest thing I had ever seen in my life. Yeah. And I actually had no idea that something like this existed. So I popped in the door um, that day sort of randomly and asked, you know, is there any sort of volunteer opportunities? Is there any way that I can um, help out? And what they did was they gave me a, a volunteer opportunity and it was to teach, I, I believe, like second or third graders, um, a, like a small class on photography. I had no idea what to do. You know, I had no idea what to say, um, but they really trusted me in terms of, you know, leading um, a class on this experience. So I brought my I think it was a Fujifilm Instax instant camera um, with me to sort of teach this class photography, thinking that it would be cool for them to see, wow, like, that you can actually, you know, get a picture right out of, right out of the camera. And um, I think that that, that stuck with outside the lens that I was willing to use my, uh, my resources and, and, and my own camera for that matter, my own film and, and give it to these kids. And what it led to was a, um, a full-time position there where I was teaching at a number of schools in San Diego, including a few Title I schools uh, that were definitely on, you know, I guess what you would consider as the uh, marginalized spectrum, um, where these, these classes didn't typically have photo or even art programs in general. The funding was slashed, and this organization was bringing these resources into these schools. And uh, really from that, that's what led to um, working with so many different organizations. So after, you know, after working with Outside the Lens for a while, there were other organizations like the Aja Project, like the David's Heart Foundation, um, like the Boys and Girls Club that had reached out to me to start either helping build programs for photography for them or being a teacher for them. Um, so it's kind of amazing that just sort of this stumbling into this, this building on, you know, a random day, um, really led to a career path that was one that I would have never imagined, but was one of the most rewarding experiences um, I've ever had. Wow. Okay. So it, quite the background and, and what a really interesting story too, a cool story. W would you say though, in this process of, I guess, beginning to teach, did it, did it naturally force you to go back and refine certain skills as you're doing this very thing that I was talking about, which is to kind of rehash internally what this particular skill as a photographer means, how it actually plays out, and then ultimately how you can effectively communicate that to someone. Did you find yourself going back and kind of restudying certain photographic skills and, and refining those skills as a result? Right. So yes, def definitely on all cylinders. And, you know, with those organizations that I mentioned uh, just a minute ago, th these are primarily with working with youth. So this would have been anywhere from, 
you know, six year olds to um, 17 year olds. And then I was mentioned to you earlier, uh, you know, prior to the podcast that I was also, I also teach um, on a college level. So that goes, you know, from 18 and, and there on the skill sets that you, you pick up on. Um, it really varies pending the age, but definitely there are tool sets that are sharpened on both ends of the spectrum. I would say for the younger age group, really what you start picking up on more than anything. And I think even more than the, you know, of course you're going to go back and revisit the basics, like the rule of thirds and, and, and composition and things like this, which sure. are definitely important. But I think what really the bigger aspect um, for the younger group that I kind of relearned or even started learning myself is the why. Why are, why are we using photography as this tool? And why, why is photography important? You know, why is communicating what's happening in our communities an important method of bringing awareness to certain situations? And I think the more that I could instill that concept into the kids, the more I started internally realizing um, what it was that I was doing myself in, in giving back to these schools and why I was doing it. And I, it started to really build a passion that I realized over time is the reason why I'm doing this is to give back to kids that were like me. I think as a, on the adult spectrum of things, um, you know, the things that I would look into more and, and learn about more was um, maybe, uh, of course, a, again, there's the technique um, like doing lighting, like how to set up a, a three point lighting setup or, or, or things like this. But then even on a, on a bigger spectrum, it was, uh, the marketing aspect, you know, how, of course, this is great that you have this camera, but how are you going to build this into a career and why do you want to build this into a career? And I think that was always the root question was the why that made me go back in and start understanding that, Asking these students those questions were the hard questions that were not necessarily asked of me when I was in school. And so in their learning it, I also intrinsically was learning that same thing about myself. Hmm. Yeah, the, the starting with, and I know there's a book. Um, yes, called, Simon Sinek. Yeah, yeah, Simon Sinek, yeah. Start With Why. But starting with why um, is not something that I think people naturally tend to go to, especially in a deeper level. And so I love that you're prioritizing that conversation with your students because that creates in them this foundation, I, kind of like the psychological foundation that I established at a relatively late age, I think. I, I wish I, I wish I'd learned some of these principles early on in my life, but um, starting with why understanding why I do what I do, what is behind that motivation, and ultimately the psychology behind that really sets a healthy framework for yes. then being not only a better human being, but ultimately a better business owner as well. If, if I'm just kind of blindly flailing about trying to make this business work and I don't have what I refer to on this podcast uh, so many times now as, as a big picture view that drives why I'm, or that drives my behavior, my actions as a business owner, then my behavior as a photography business owner is much more haphazard in nature. Um, the business right. will likely not be as sustainable over the long run. I can get burnt out more easily and um, yep. I'm likely not going to enjoy it as much either. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, whether it's a camera or a lens or film or, you know, computer, whatever it is, these tools that we use are ultimately means to an end or should, I think, be means to an end. And that end is the answer to the question, why? Why am I doing this in the first place? What's motivating that? And if we're not clear about that, then we're missing out. So I, I'm glad. It's really cool to hear, actually, that you're putting such priority on communicating the, the significance of this principle to your students. But, you know, taking this a step further, I, I'm curious, and this is, I was really excited about getting into this element of, of teaching specifically. Yes. Um, communication. Uh, yes. As, as you took a step back and you looked at your why and how then you could translate the significance of this principle to these students. Um, right. I mean, it's, it's one thing to understand what we mean to ourselves, right? It's another thing to be able to effectively communicate what we mean to someone else, not only in a way that they can understand it just on a basic level uh, because of the words that we're using, but then also in a way that they can relate to something that resonates right. with them. So I'm curious, what are a couple of the most important principles that you've learned about better communication through teaching? Right. So in, in terms of communication, uh, 
to achieve better communication for teaching, uh, one concept that I would relay to the students. And uh, now I, when I refer to the students, because I, like I told you, I worked on a spectrum of students. So they were young and, and college level. So I'm speaking right now towards the college level. One of the principles that I really wanted to get across was, and this, this kind of relates to that concept of, of the why, what are you doing photography for? And I would break it down in a, you know, and this, this is a, like a very simple breakdown, but I would break it down in terms of, are you doing this for art or are you doing this for money? And what I mean by that is when I studied in grad school for um, my MFA, the, the program was pushing so much for fine art, for a conceptual based concept that you were doing so that one day you could be an artist in a, in a gallery or, or something like to this nature. Um, I was always raised on the idea in, in my family in particular that, you know, a career would have to do be something that made money. So I was always kind of entangled with these two concepts. Are you doing it for art or are you doing it for money? And one thing that I wanted to make sure that I was communicating um, through my teaching was this concept, are you doing it for art or are you do, doing it for money? Meaning that, you know, do you have a passion in a particular subject so strong that you are willing to, um, you know, risk it all, possibly earn nothing in this field for doing it, but you believe in it so strong that the art of it is what calls you to it. And I think allowing a student to really ruminate and I, and and digest that concept that they may have a belief that may not have a return for them. And if they are okay with that, then I want to be able to help you push forward with that said idea or concept, no matter what happens in the end, whether you make it big or you don't. Vice versa, if you're doing it for money, um, if you just want to make a career what things will I need to teach you along the way that will help you better make this a career? Will I need to set you up with other photographers um, that are working in a commercial space? Um, do we have to do more emphasis on lighting and less emphasis on conceptualization? Um, that was one of my major principles that I would say um, that I focused on the class because it was my it was my ability to break the level of communication as a teacher and get into a real world scenario. What is to happen with this work after it's made? Is the end goal that you want it to be in a gallery to influence people um, to maybe feel a certain way? Or is your goal that you just want to have a, a job or that you want to make a career um, in this industry? And both sections of that I believe are completely valid. I think that there are, you know, there's just as much validation for somebody that wants to be an artist versus somebody that just wants to be a quote, you know, quote unquote commercial artist. Um, but I think making that deciding factor um, early on, it allows me as a teacher to give you a field of resources and really open up a door of conversation that maybe is uncomfortable to have. So I guess ultimately understanding is going back to that idea of understanding their why enables you to be able to more effectively teach them and help them. Exactly. Understanding the why helps you understand them. And it, I think it breaks down a barrier um, between this level of that you're just a teacher and now you're actually somebody that is willing to help them on it on another level. Yeah. Well, and I mean, it goes back to the significance of my, well, I guess my original question really, which was what are important principles you learned about communication? It starts with an exploration of that, that individual's motivations. You know, I, when I, Agreed. one of the reasons that I, I think that this notion of belief is so poignant, it's not just for me and understanding that what I believe ultimately, and I'm not talking about religious beliefs. I just mean literally anything. Like I sit down on this chair because I believe yes. it's going to hold me up, right? I mean, we, we exercise belief constantly throughout our daily lives. If I understand what I believe, then that enables me to make change as needed and continue to grow as a human being. If I understand what somebody else believes or their series of beliefs, and there are going to be a lot of them, um, that better enables me to be able to effectively communicate to them, with them, 
A, B, also then help direct them where they want to go to, to enable them, as you were pointing out, Alex. And I think that's a really important concept. And maybe it, maybe I haven't tied this back to what, why I think this is so important for our, our photographers um, to, to quite enough detail yet. But to, to take it back just a little bit, I think for so many photographers in our industry who are wanting to be teachers, wanting to go on the, the speaking circuit, speak at conferences and workshops and, you know, right. teach online courses. It, it seems like a, one of the biggest motivations has been just, just that it's popular. There are a lot of people doing it. It's yes. so like, oh, I want to do that thing too. And I think there's some sort of significance that certain photographers want to feel, whether it's conscious or subconscious. And, and by having a little bit of notoriety, being out there, uh, for all to see. And and I understand that too. I've, I've had very similar feelings in the past. But at the end of the day, if we're not taking time as teachers, as those of us who've had the opportunity to teach, to present, to speak, whether it's online or in person, to understand the people that we are speaking to, the belief systems that are driving them, then it keeps yes. us from being able to effectively communicate with them. Uh, so I, I think this is a really great reminder for everybody. And certainly on a, just on a very simple day-to-day -day basis in our personal interactions, it's important to understand the beliefs of those we're interacting with, but it certainly translates to teaching as well. Uh, 100%. I mean, yes, I agree with, with all of that for sure. Really quick, the other just principle that I wanted to touch on was just the idea of um, making everything uh, feel real world. And what I mean by that is, you know, really, there's so much that we can do in the classroom. There's, um, you know, th there's there's the level of the classroom that, of course, is there to teach a a skill. But I think to that point, the skill, especially in today's age, a lot of those things like like the skill side, you know, a tutorial, um, a lot of those things, you know, those can be found online. And I'm not one of those teachers that is stuck in this old mindset that, you know, learning something through YouTube is different than when I teach it in, in the classroom because I'm, you know, have an MFA. I don't think that, you know, having those things make you any better than, you know, a 17 year old kid that learned it on the screen. It really can speak through their work. And so one of the things that I wanted to do always in my classroom was to make things feel more real world and not just giving somebody a tutorial or have to follow along with me. So one way that I would communicate um, through teaching was actually reaching out to folks in the community and showing uh, my students, whether it's through a field trip or to bring them into a photographer's studio, um, I wanted to show them what people are really doing in the real world and allowing them to be able to interact with those folks. Um, one photographer that had really, um, you know, rocked with me on this, on this concept was Tim Antoine, who, you know, had passed very recently of, of cancer, but Tim wow. was a, uh, was a landmark photographer in the San Diego region. Uh, he did, if you're f familiar with like EA sports, he did all the Madden, uh, covers for oh, like wow. PS4. Yeah. He shot all that right in house in San Diego. Wow. And he would give them a full, um, a full lecture and show his studio and lend equipment. And I think that's our biggest power as teachers is to make things as real world as possible, because yes, there are things that are important in class that we do need to focus on, but I think really preparing students for a life outside of the classroom is the most important thing that we can be doing as teachers. So anytime I could provide an experience like this, um, that was my go-to method of teaching. Yeah. And, and that's also a great reminder. And again, I'm thinking of workshop speakers, uh, conference speakers that are also photographers. If you're not making that information practical, um, in a very yes. tangible way, it's it, it only is so much. It only adds so much value to the the audience of photographers' lives. And you know, I've seen this, especially even in the last, I will call it six months or so. Listening to photographers speak at conferences or workshops, there's unfortunately a lot of fluff and and not a lot of practical, tangible, actionable yes. information that they can relate to, that a photographer can relate to, can take and go do something with. And so we really need to put more emphasis on making something, as you say, feel real world, making it practical and applicable to their daily lives as business owners. I think that's really important as well. Um, just very quickly, because I, kn I know you have limited time, uh, as do yep. I, but just will you touch just briefly on how to, because this is something else that I'm seeing at photography conferences, unfortunately, a lot of 
photographers will just throw a bunch of text up onto a slide and a yes. couple of things happen. One, when you see a lot of text, now suddenly the, the, the person in the audience or the people in the audience are distracted from the, the presenter or the teacher and trying to consume all this text on the screen. Then the other thing that happens now in you know, 2019, 2020 in particular is that you see photographers pop up their phone and grab a screenshot of that slide, which means they're not really actually taking the time to consume that information and the likelihood of them then going back later on to consume it um, and effectively understand it is not very high. So very simply, how can somebody who is teaching um, more effectively design a slide so that it is easy to understand and is not distracting from the conversation at hand? Right. So I have just two points on this one, which is uh, and I 100% agree with this, this idea that they're like, when we use things like slides, um, you know, I don't want that to be a, a crutch that just has a bunch of information on there. And somebody thinks because they downloaded my slides, now they understand, you know, everything that I, you know, have uh, disseminated on the screen, the slides, you know, I, to, to your point, I mean, yeah, the, I think the slide should be minimal and should really just have root concepts. I mean, a lot of the times, like we've been talking about this concept of the why, a lot of times, like my slides would have things that just say words like why. Yes. And then what we would do is open up a, a class discussion where everybody would have to, you know, talk about what they felt about this particular subject. Um, I think that having, you know, the, the basis, the base root of your, uh, your lecture is key but I think it's really the dialogue they're in. I mean, that's the point of being in this teaching space is that we're not there just giving somebody a bunch of books. We're having, we're opening a discussion, you know, of, of what it means to them and what it means to me. And we're, we're active in that discussion. So I think keeping things down to roots are um, very important. I'd also say that um, I love using, for, for instance, Google Slides just because it allows me to update things as often as I need to, which I think a lot of times too many teachers are going back and pulling slides from uh, 2004 about photography, but maybe they're not making mention of how photography has changed yeah. um, since then. And I think that that is a, uh, you know, a, a negative thing on a lot of teachers that what I like using uh, web-based slides is that it has me go in often to update them. And I want to make sure that my slides are updated because this industry has certainly changed, um, you know, whether it's since the nineties, since the 2000, and I'm imagining it's going to keep on changing. So I think it's to our benefit as teachers to keep, um, updating our slides as often as we can. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause you, you see this from photography presenters, those who are uh, popular on the circuit, you'll hear a lot of the same stuff from them over and over. Um, it is important to keep up to date, but to go back to your, your first point though, very, very simple words. In fact, um, Seth Godin is a favorite author of mine that I've read yep. in years past. And one of the things that he would do, the, the primary thing actually that he would do in this regard was to not put any words on the screen, instead just to have an image that represents the idea that he is re referencing at that particular moment in the presentation. And yes. that is really powerful because, I mean, first of all, you know, the cliche, a picture is worth a thousand words. Instead of cramming literally paragraphs, you'll see some photographers, presenters put, you know, five, 10 points up on, on a screen all at once for somebody to try to consume all at once. Instead of doing that, take all the words out, put an image up there, maybe one word to go along with that, as you were pointing out, Alex. And now yes. the individual has an opportunity to kind of connect the thoughts that immediately flood to their mind with what the teacher is saying, because they can still put their attention on the teacher uh, because they're not yes. distracted trying to read paragraphs of text. Uh, so I, I think this is a really good reminder, but I want to jump to the last question here really quick. If, if you yes. just sum up your teaching experience with a few of the most important principles that you've learned, and, and more specifically that photographers who are wanting to get into teaching should keep in mind, what would those principles be? Right. Um, my main things for anyone that's thinking about doing the uh, role of to be becoming a teacher, what I think is one of the most important roles that we have um, you know, in the world, the first thing is, Hey, we've been talking about it a, a heck of a lot. Start with that. Why, yes. why do you want to teach? And you need to really think about that. For me, it was reaching out to, um, communities that were marginalized and giving back because that is a community that I come from. And that is the reason why. So it was not 
for a paycheck to do this type of position. It was because I wanted to make direct change in people like myself. And I think everybody should come to a conclusion, um, being a teacher, knowing that this role is a role that is underfunded oftentimes, that mm. we are the first to be cut of resources. Um, I want to make sure that people out there that want to become teachers are doing it for reasons because they want to help shape the minds of um, youth and that they want to create a better society through what they're teaching. So I think starting with that why is the number one. Secondly, I'd say, what's your niche? Um, make sure that you have a, a niche and a concept that you want to overall get into. Um, for me, and again, I, I talk about this why, no matter what I taught, whether it was lighting, whether it was Photoshop, whether it was marketing for photographers, and this also uh, spans whether it was young or old, getting this idea of why you wanted to do it, this was always at a root of what it was that I was teaching. So I think making sure that there's a niche and a, and a concept that you want to get out overall to your um, students is going to do you some due diligence. And then lastly, I would say definitely use your network. Um, as a teacher, that is the greatest resource that we have as having went to, you know, whether you, you went to grad school or you went to school for teaching or, you know, you've just met some great folks along the way. Um, bringing those people into those students, you have no idea how much having somebody come into a group of kids that might not even know that photography is a real career and have them show this class, you know, what they do on a, on a daily basis. That is the kernel or the seed that awakens the mind to show people that something is even possible. So for us as teachers, using that, that network um, for your students is going to open up doors to them that they didn't even think were possible to open. Well, I, I really appreciate the summation. Um, and, and again, I think I know that you're referencing specifically what it might be like for photographers listening in to go into a teaching role in, in schools. But I think this is also yes. applicable to those who just simply want to are interested in teaching again online virtually or teaching in workshops and conferences. Um, I, yes. I, I love that you emphasize the significance of the why again, because I, I, I can speak from personal experience. When I first wanted to, to teach, uh, to speak at a conference, very selfishly, and I was much younger too and didn't have life experience, but very selfishly, I just, I wanted the notoriety. I mean, it felt good to be recognized and to have some attention. And uh, it was a very selfish motivation. I think ultimately finding a why that is bigger than ourselves, as you pointed out, and what you're ultimately striving for, Alex, is a really great reminder. It's a great example of what we should be striving for as teachers, whatever level that we have the opportunity to teach at. Focusing on a niche really does make a big difference too, because that enables us not only to dial in our expertise in regard to that particular topic, but it also helps us establish a sort of brand position, if you will, um, on as a an expert on that particular topic. I think that's really great as well. And then certainly leveraging our network it can be such a absolutely valuable resource. I, I really appreciate your perspective and and really with all of this related to, to teaching as photography or as, as a photographer. Um, I mean, I see the, the value, how it made you a better photographer because of self-reflection. And I think that's really powerful in and of itself. But I think these have also been good principles for photographers listening in to keep in mind as they consider the possibility of teaching in some form or fashion. I really appreciate you sharing this value with us today. Oh, 100%. And uh, Nathan, I just wanted to make mention too, um, you know, I've been following the podcast uh, and, and listening to a lot of the speakers you have, and this isn't something that was directly linked to the teaching concept, but I just wanted to say um, how grateful I am to have the opportunity to speak on this platform and that um, as an African-American male myself, this industry as a whole is um, underrepresented in our community. And I think you taking the time um, and what I what I've been seeing is it's you're specifically taking the time um, and a lot of times not only to speak to all people, but you are lifting up voices of people of color. And I think that that's something that is uh, so welcomed right now. And I'm very appreciative of you doing that, um, because I think a lot of times in this industry, you know, our voices are are not always heard um, and maybe not heard the same way. So I think the fact that you're actually taking time uh, to, to lift up this voice um, is incredibly important. And, you know, that was one of the main reasons 
why I had gotten into this teaching experience as a whole, um, whether it was working, like I said, organizations like David's Harp or the Aja Project or Outside the Lens, it was always to give back um, to members of the community that are marginalized. And I think, um, you know, spreading any knowledge and awareness to these types of organizations is a, is a great thing. And so I, I really tip my hat to you and your team for producing a podcast um, that is, you know, opening this, this conversation. I, I, that's very gracious of you to say, and it's a privilege to be able to have important conversation. That was my original goal. You talk about fighting for a bigger idea. My One of my biggest goals when starting the podcast in the, in the beginning was to bring exposure to conversation or ideas that maybe at times would be tough to address. Um, yes. But I... I I enjoy, I personally and, and kind of selfishly just enjoy conversation in general. I enjoy connecting with individuals. This platform has given me that opportunity. And I'm glad that we've had the opportunity, particularly in recent weeks, to have what is really important conversation regarding racial equity in the photography industry. And and I hope that we can continue to do so. But again, your, your, your words are very gracious, very, very kind. It's just a privilege to have you on the show. I appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us. And just one more time before we go, we remind our listeners where they can find you online. Yes, of course. Uh, find me on artistbean.com is my website. Um, artistbean is my handle also on Instagram. And I'm really lackadaisy on the rest of the social media <laughs> platforms. But I, I'm sure that I will be on TikTok. So just always look for that name <laughs> okay. somewhere. And I'm sure sometime I'll be floating on one of them. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. Well, yeah. congratulations on the upcoming parenthood as well. Uh, thanks oh, for thank making so time much. for all of us today. Really, really appreciate it. Hey, I appreciate it too. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, photographers, for listening to the Boca Podcast. Will you let us know what you thought of the show by leaving a review of the podcast in the Apple Podcast app? And I'd love to hear from you personally with your thoughts about the podcast and suggestions about future topics and guests for the show. My email is nathan at bocapodcast.com. We do try to bring this show to you commercial free, so make sure to check out our sponsors, photographersedit.com and milu, M-I-I-L-U.com. Photographers Edit is custom photo editing for the professional photographer, and milu is the simplest way to create and manage timelines and shot lists for the events you're photographing.